Chapter 1, Fundamentals of Physics. What is physics? Well, it's derived from the word fuses, that's Greek, which means nature. Nature is of two types, natural phenomena, physical nature. Natural phenomena means an event, and physics tries to explain this event, like the twinkling of stars, for example. Physical nature, on the other hand, is something like matter, like plants, or the air, or water. So that's the basic part of it. In physics, we have many different branches. Classical mechanics, which deals with study of various uh, parts of physics, but with respect to only the particle-like nature of matter. So we don't take into account wave nature. But in quantum mechanics, we take both particle nature and wave nature into consideration. In other words, it's more like a recent physics. Optics has to do with light, electrodynamics, electricity, electric charges. Thermodynamics has to do with temperature, heat, coldness, engines, you name it. We have four fundamental forces of nature. The first one is the gravitational force. Now, this is a mutual attraction between two bodies, and they should have mass, of course. These two bodies will attract one another, meaning object A will attract B, and object B will attract A. Now, this is a long-range force. You can see nearly all objects in the universe exhibiting this, like the Earth and the Sun. They have a gravitational pull on each other, but it is an extremely weak force. In fact, it's the weakest force known in nature. It's easy to overcome. When we get out of bed every day, we overcome the gravitational force. Second one is electromagnetic force. Well, this has to do with the propagation of waves. What kind of waves? The electromagnetic spectrum. That means radio waves, microwaves, then infrared, light, UV, gamma, x-rays, cosmic rays. Then the third and the fourth have to do with nuclear forces. So we have a weak nuclear and a strong nuclear. Weak nuclear is responsible for beta decay. That's the nucleus, the neutrons in the nucleus split into electrons and protons. Whereas the strong nuclear fo force holds the nucleus together. You know, we have protons in the nucleus which want to repel one another, but this provides a nuclear binding force which holds the nucleus together and prevents it from collapsing. Next, we'll discuss scientific investigation. Opposing the religious views, the scientific view constantly keeps changing based on observations, experiments, and the results of these experiments. So, the first step is to make an observation. Based on this observation, a person might make a hypothesis which may be true or false. Then they'll maybe make a suitable experiment to try to support their hypothesis. You can never completely prove a hypothesis. You can support it with evidence from your experiment. And if this hypothesis is pretty good, and you know, so far no experiment, no one has disproven it, then it gets the seat of a theory. So it's like it gets promoted to that. A hypothesis becomes a theory. Now, what's the difference between a theory and a law? A law is something made by nature, and it is always true like the law of conservation of mechanical energy or charge, momentum, these are never broken. But theory is made by man. It can be true or false, like the mass energy theorem, E is equal to mc squared. Although many experiments have proven it, well, not we can't really say proven it, but support it, it still is kind of shake, on shaky ground. Next, the Big Bang Theory, the universe started with an explosion, this too cannot really be explained or proven. And the atomic theory given by Rutherford, that actually has a few flaws. All right, next, one of the fundamental basics, units. A unit is a standard which we use to measure a physical quantity. So there are two types, fundamental units and derived units. The fundamental units measure physical quantities like mass, for example, kilogram. A gram is a fundamental unit. What about derived units? Derived units are made up of two or more fundamental units, like let's take the physical quantity velocity, meter per second. So it has two 
fundamental units in this case. Now, the fundamental units can be divided into three groups, three systems, in fact, the CGS, that's centimeter gram second, FPS, foot handle second, MKS, meter kilogram second. So as you can notice, they all measure the same three physical quantities. That's length, mass, and time. But they have different values. So this is quite confusing if we want to keep converting between these. So that's why finally scientists got together and they made a standard system of units called the SI units. And this was done in 1971. There are seven SI units for the physical quantities, length, mass, time, temperature, luminous intensity, amount of substance, electric current, and their respective units given. And in addition to this, we have the supplementary units, that's the radian and the steradian. Radian is a plane angle. If you just draw a circle or any angle that's on a paper, you can represent a radian through that. Or you can use the unit radian to measure that. If I make a cone, the angle in that cone is the steradian can be measured using steradian. Then you notice both of these are dimensionless, the radian and the steradian, because length by radius, both of these physical quantities use meter. And similarly for steradian, you have area by uh, radius square. Both of these will end up having what? Meter square, up and down in the numerator and the denominator, which cancel out to make it have no units in the end. Then comes the scientific notation. Now physics is known for calculations, of course. So we all can't write our answers in different ways. There's a standard way of writing it, and that's scientific notation. That's m into 10 to the power n. So m is a number that's between 1 and 10, like 5, 6, 3.1, so nothing less than 1 and nothing greater than 10. And the 10 to the power n, now n is an integer, so from minus infinity to plus infinity, all the integers, OK? So let's just, there are a couple of examples given. So in A, you just need to take the decimal point of that large number <laughs> to the left, and you can then find out, to see, move it how many places until the number lies between 1 and 10. And that will be 3.6, and what will N be the number of places that were moved, and that'll, that's 12. And B, I, I'll leave it to you. It's all about moving the decimal place. It's pretty logical. Then converting between units. Now we need a conversion factor for this. Of course, we can only convert between those units which are for the same physical quantity, like both inches and centimeter are both for length. Similarly, minute and second are both for time. So we can interconvert. So one minute is equal to 60 seconds. So you can, run one, you can write one minute by 60 seconds is equal to 60 seconds by one minute, which is equal to one. And you can use this in a conversion uh, in the example given below, units can cancel out like how variables do. Like when we solve a mathematical equation, you can cancel out x and y sometimes, right? Well, you can think of a unit as an x or y that you cancel out. They work that way. Next is the prefix system. Now, we got far enough to write scientific notation. Well, we want to shorten it more. So if I have 3.6 into 10 to the power of 3 meters, 10 to the power of 3 can be substituted with kilo which is just written as k. So we get km, that's kilometers. So powers of 10 get substituted by a prefix. And this prefix will, of course, come before the unit. So there's a table given. And knowing these are pretty useful, so you have giga, mega, kilo, deci, centi, milli, micro, nano, each with their respective symbols and factors, which they replace. Notice that micro has the symbol mu which is a uh, Greek alphabet. So some examples are given. You can go through it. You can just pause and take a look and see if you get the idea. Next are the errors. What are errors? These are uncertainty in measurements. So there's something wrong. We have a true value and a measured value. There is some difference between the true value and the measured value, and that's why we have an error. Now. There are two types of errors, systematic errors and random errors. Systematic errors, they have a particular direction, meaning we can find a cause for this error and we can correct it. Like, for example, a personal error, someone who maybe tilts their head towards their right-hand side when they read a value from a burette. Obviously, they're going to get a wrong value if they do that. 
Then we have instrumental errors. There's something wrong with your instrument. It's damaged or there's some, you know, maybe it has zero error. Then we've got, there's a fault in your experimental technique. Maybe you're using an outdated technique and hence you have an error. Notice, notice that you can correct all these mistakes and get the right value. Then random errors. Now random errors, we just don't know why this is happening, but it's not matching. A very simple example is, take a group of students and ask them all to measure the blackboard's length. They all will get a different value. It is highly unlikely that they get the same value. Now for some reason they get a different value. We can't really you know, narrow it down. So this is a random error. All right, now when we come across measurements, we've get, got these two terms, accuracy and precision. Accuracy means how close is your true val is the your measured value to the true value like notice my values and your values in the example given take a look at the mean so the true value is 6.01 centimeters i got 6.41 and you got 6.13 now which one is closer to the true value of course yours is so it's more accurate what about precision precision is the measured values how close are they to each other so we don't really care about the true value. Now take a look at my values and your values. You can see that my values differ by 0 0.05 and your values differ by 0 0.25, 0 0.15, 0 0.10. So they vary much more than mine do. So mine is more precise. So I hope you get the idea. Stay tuned for the next chapter.